Something that we must keep in mind while writing code for an RTOS is memory management. Understanding where data is stored in memory will help us prevent stack overflows and memory leaks. Let's take a look at a simple C code example and see where things get allocated in memory. Your compiler will know how much memory is required for global and static variables when it's finished compiling your program. As a result, as soon as your program starts running, a section of memory will be allocated for just those variables. This section is labeled as static memory and cannot be used for other parts of the program. Any global or static variables that you declare will be stored in this section of memory. This is known as static allocation. These variables exist for the entire duration of the program. Inside of a function call, local variables are pushed to the stack. Note that the stack is a last-in, first-out system, which makes it easy to continually push variables to the stack when making nested function calls. Upon returning to the caller function, variables can be popped off the stack as part of the return data or deleted entirely. Memory is deallocated when a function returns. While the compiler will reserve as much stack as it thinks is needed for local variables, the stack can grow in size, automatically allocating what's needed from free memory. You'll often see this happen with things like recursive function calls. Local variables, arguments, and local pointers are stored in the stack. This is known as automatic allocation. There's a third area of memory called the heap. Like the stack, it can grow as the program runs, and it usually grows toward the stack. Note that this exact layout can change among processor architectures and compilers. The static section could be toward the top, or the stack might be at the bottom. Check your data sheet if you'd like to see exactly how the memory is allocated for these three functions. The heap is used for dynamic allocation where you, the programmer, explicitly tells the memory to create space for what you're about to store. You would normally do this with a function like malloc. Note that in C and C++, you are required to free up any memory you dynamically allocated when you are done using it. If you forget to do so, like at the end of a function, you could cause the heap to continue growing indefinitely. This is known as a memory leak and can be sometimes difficult to track down. Additionally, the heap and stack could run into each other if you let them grow unbounded and start overwriting each other's memory. This is also bad and could cause some nasty undefined effects. There is some protection, like malloc should return null if it can't dynamically create new memory. You might also find that your microcontroller just throws an error and resets. Let's take a look at how FreeRTOS allocated memory at runtime. When you create a new task, that task is assigned a portion of memory from the heap. That portion is divided up into a task control block, or TCB, and a stack unique to that task. The TCB is a struct that keeps vital information about the task, such as the location of the task's stack and the task's priority level. The stack is what we saw earlier when calling x task create or x task create pin to core. We tell the OS how much heap to set aside to act as a stack for our particular task. If we don't set aside enough, we can start to unintentionally overwrite parts of memory, causing undefined behavior or reset the processor. Each task we create will automatically set aside a new TCB and stack inside the heap. When we start talking about kernel objects, like queues and semaphores, these will be stored in the heap as well. Note that there is a way to allocate static memory for tasks and kernel objects in newer versions of FreeRTOS. This can be really useful in critical applications like medical devices or satellites, where a memory leak could be catastrophic. To enable this, you need to define the config support static allocation parameter as 1. Right now, it does not seem that ESPIDF has this set by default, so we can't use static tasks out of the box with our ESP32. Whenever you dynamically allocate memory, your program will attempt to find the largest contiguous block of heap available and give that to you. If you're constantly allocating and freeing heap, you may end up fragmenting it, which could result in it growing toward the stack more quickly even if you have some free spots available. Because of that, FreeRTOS gives you a few heap allocation schemes that you can choose from. When you're including the FreeRTOS code in your own build system, you must pick one of these source files as your heap management scheme. Heap 1 does not allow memory to be freed. Prior to static allocation support, you wanted to use this scheme to make parts of the heap act like static memory. Free RTOS considers heap 2 to be obsolete in favor of heap 4, which allows fragmented areas of the heap to be joined together. This helps reduce fragmentation. 
Note that the normal C malloc and free functions are not thread safe, and the time it takes for each to execute cannot be determined at compile time. Heap 3 wraps the malloc and free functions to allow them to be thread safe. Heap 5 is probably the most advanced, as it allows non-contiguous sections of the heap to be allocated as a single block. I personally see Heap 4 being used most often, or if it's a critical application where the coding standard does not allow for dynamic allocation, the programmer will stick to Heap 1 or static allocation. I recommend reading about the heap allocation schemes on this free RTOS page if you want to know more. The ESP32 has several different types of RAM, and as a result, the heap allocation scheme is a little more complicated than the one used for vanilla free RTOS. We won't get into the ESP32 specific heap allocation scheme here, but know you can head to this page in the docs to read more about it. What we really care about is making sure we don't run out of stack space in each of our tasks and that we don't run out of total heap. Let's start with a bare bones example where we spawn one task that does nothing but store some numbers in an array and then print one of those numbers. We'll delete the setup and loop task just to be sure that there's only one task running. Let's start with a pretty big array, say 100 elements. Because these are ints, that should be 400 bytes. We only gave the task one kilobyte of stack and around 768 bytes of that is overhead. This array should easily take up more stack memory than what we have left. If we run this, we might see the output a few times, but the processor resets after a few moments. This is usually a good indication that we overflowed our allocated stack buffer. The stack canary watch point refers to the fact that the operating system sets some known values to the last few bytes in stack and checks them periodically. If they changed from those known values, then this error is thrown and the processor resets. It's a safety check to prevent a stack overflow, and while you can change this error catching behavior, I don't recommend doing that for now. To fix this, we need to go back into our program and take a look at our task's allocated stack. We know that 768 bytes is required for overhead, so any local variables must be added on top of that, plus a little extra as a safety net. If you calculate the needed memory for this task, you'll find that it's about 1200 bytes. Let's change our stack size to be a little more than that, say 1500, just to be sure. Upload again. You'll see that the program should run without issue. Another thing you can do is call the UX task get stack high watermark from the free RTOS API. This will let you know how many bytes you have left in the task's stack. Note that it's reported in words, so you'd want to multiply this by 4 to get the available bytes in a 32-bit system. If this starts to approach 0, you know you're about to overflow your stack, and you'll likely trigger that canary error and reset. We can also watch the total amount of heap memory available to us with the export get heap size function. Unlike the stack high watermark, this gives us total available heap in bytes rather than words. Let's see what happens when we print out the heap size before and after we use malloc to allocate some memory. In vanilla free RTOS, unless you're using the heap3 scheme, you'll want to use PV port malloc, as regular malloc is not thread safe. In ESP IDF, you can use regular malloc, but I'd like to keep this as close to vanilla free RTOS as possible. We'll need to pretend to do something with that memory so the compiler doesn't optimize it out. I'll add in a slight delay so we can watch what happens. Let's upload this and open a serial monitor. You can see the difference in the heap before and after the malloc call. Also, you can see it rapidly count down to zero. When it hits close to zero, the ESP32 resets. Why is that? We forgot to free the memory. Back in our code, let's first add a simple check to prevent this from happening in the future. malloc and PV port malloc should return null if it's out of heap memory. So we can just check that to make sure our memory got allocated. If not, we could throw an error or return an error code. Let's upload that and see what happens. Sure enough, when the counter reaches some low value where it doesn't have enough contiguous space to allocate our memory, we get a message saying that it ran out of heap. Let's do what we were supposed to do and free up the dynamically allocated memory when we're done using it. Just like with malloc, we should use a special free RTOS function to make sure it's thread safe. Here, it's vport free. Let's upload this again. Now, we see that our portion of allocated heap is only used for the duration of that one pass through the while loop. The memory is successfully deallocated before the next iteration of that loop. Your challenge, should you choose to accept it, is to create two tasks that mimic a simple serial echo program. One task is to listen for input from the serial monitor. 
When it sees a new line character, it should store everything up to that point in a newly allocated chunk of heap memory that perfectly fits the string. It then needs to somehow notify task B that the message is ready. Task B, when it sees that a new message is ready, prints this message to the serial terminal and then frees up the heap memory. If you did it right, it should echo back whatever you send it in the serial monitor. Good luck. We're all counting on you. In the next video, we'll talk about queues, how to use them and how to set them up in free RTOS.